Hello and welcome back and uh, I've got the big number one so that I can follow uh, as I develop this uh, video and uh, because I can only do maybe a, an hour here in my schedule I have to come back I, I work full-time and uh, so I've been kind of oriented to this number one call of the laity but let's put here I'll read it for those so we have some people that are blind that follow us and uh, and I, I want to kind of confront some issues here with this opening. But here in the United States uh, of America, from the Monastery of the Lay Order of the Joint Carmels, I bring you this interview. Now, let's talk about that. I just created it. I got some friends that are uh, lay members, and uh, we've had some problems with the Order of Carmel that is uh, uh, run and organized by the the friars. Teresa of Avila initiated reform and started a religious order for women and that was a religious order started by a woman and uh, but she's religious and so we're charismatically starting uh, uh, a joint order the, the two orders of Carmel. You have the Discalced Carmel and you have the regular Carmel of the, uh, and they are not united. They were united at once and they split. So we're starting out as laity, and we're, we have this lay order of Malta that we heard about. We thought, wow, I didn't know that laity could start an order. And you have the lay order of Malta. You can Google that. And so we haven't asked permission. We haven't said, hey, give us a uh, stamp. Here, we're going to pay you money. We're just doing it. And uh, we'll get into that later on a separate set of tapes. But as you go through this series, you'll realize you don't need permission to do a lot of things. So... Uh, we are the lay order of the Joint Carmels. Maybe we can come up with a better name, but I want to let you know that's part of the, the message that we're sharing is that you can initiate action to help in the church without permission of clergy. Okay? Now, I've wanted to do this for some time, and uh, uh, this format, and I haven't had a chance, and, and uh, I want to give attribution to uh, Father Z in his blog and I've seen what he did and how he approached this and he's a brighter light than I am so uh, I don't I have very very few original ideas so I want you to know that ahead of time I'm not the brightest light bulb in the, in, in the box but you know if you're like me and you're not the brightest light bulb and you care let's just care together let's think about how we can do certain things to solve certain problems that seems to be uh, send tremors, uh, I, I, waves of fear in the clergy. They don't seem to want to talk about it. They don't seem to want to recognize it. And they just tremble when they see this dominion of the lie rear its ugly head, or even the shadow, or the empire of injustice, even the shadow. And I don't think of myself as some, uh, I don't go out in parks and like some social justice warrior and hang signs. I, 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 I'm not, I, never, I don't get arrested. I'm just saying, look, there's some things that are pretty obvious that most everybody I talk to agrees it's wrong. But there's fear about how to share that voice because there's fear of retaliation. And we'll try to do some interviews on that. But today, here's a nice format. And, and he's an authority. Uh, today we have as our guest Archbishop O. Lee Cruz. I read for you the whole of Archbishop Cruz's address uh, to the church, a uh, speech in book form called uh, Call of the Laity. Okay? The whole speech book is imbued with a sense of hope and optimism. That's what I want. Hope and optimism. It's not, aha, I caught you with, you know, this or that. No. We got to talk about what you did wrong. We got to talk about what needs to be fixed. We got to talk about the diagnosis in order to get a prescription for a fix. So uh, it's hope and optimism. And, I, and Father Cruz describes the situation of the church in the modern world. You're going to be doing the same thing. Remember uh, the introductory video. Help! I want to encourage new voices that describe situations in the church, because I, 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 in the church. Although I wrote from the formamentus of the church, the mindset, the mindset and point of view of the church as she, Mother Church, spouse of Christ, sees it. Not as your bishop sees it, not as your priest sees it, not as your deacon sees it, or your lay staff see it. 
But what is the vision of the mother church? How does she see it? You know, can two people disagree on how to, how to, how to approach something? I think so. They can disagree on how, what, what food to order at a restaurant. Just watch them. And so uh, this is not, uh, I don't think this is the end times. I'm very hopeful. And I think this is great opportunity, great opportunity for laity to come forth and share their ideas and share their vision. And when they are not allowed access to the microphone, I'm going to show you how to share your voice. Okay? You're allowed to share your voice. It's an absolute right. And there's not a clergy alive that has any mandate from God, any power or authority to stifle your voice that's speaking on justice, that's speaking on truth. That's, and in fact, that, that original justice was the state of being that we were created in. That's where we originated at. And, uh, and truth is what we want to consume. We want to eat truth. We want to live on truth. We don't want to live our lives uh, based on false impressions. We want to consume truth. And we'll talk about some of the Carmelite saints that just said, look, they want only to be uh, dwelling in the dimension of fidelity, consuming truth, and they don't want to be deceived. Okay? And when you talk about deception, that's a move away from truth. And there is, a, there is an adversary. It's Satan. You're going to have adversaries. So uh, this is uh, what we want to talk about. And I wanted to show you this is the call of the laity. And this is our, our, uh, our tape one. And this is our introductory tapes. I've been a little bit longer than I wanted to. But let's see how this goes. And I'll see what happens here. Let's open this up. This is all of the, what we'll try to go through. And I'm thinking this is going to be the better part of uh, a year. And then uh, we'll take a look at this, this forward here. And this is his talking to us. And this is kind of helpful. Here is uh, his speech to us. Who are the laity? It's, his, it's a sermon. He's a priest. He's an archbishop. Who are the laity? Who are lay men and lay women? Who are lay youth? Why are they such? What are they in the church? Are they but passive members of the church? Do they, have, do they always have to depend on the clergy before they could move or act? <coughs> Excuse me. What can they do and may do on their own instance and initiative? What are their rights vis-a-vis -vis their obligations as laypersons in the church? You see that? And that's why I started off with the challenge here. We're going to have a lay order of the Joint Carmels. Now he goes on. The purpose of this little book. You see, when you begin to share your voice, you can share the purpose of why you're sharing the voice. In fact, I did that in the original introductory uh, about what, what's our purpose? What value am I pitching to you? The purpose of this little book is to answer these legitimate questions. It must be admitted that there are some human and sacred truths about the laity in the church that are not well known to the clergy and to the religious, and most probably not known at all to a good number of the laity themselves. Hopefully, this short publication should be of some help in providing and promoting that needed information. It would be a pity for these truths, uh, which are not only distinct and profound, but also relevant and practical, are not given due attention. This short publication sincerely hopes to make them manifest one way or the other. He is wanting to diffuse a vision and a message too, a voice, and his vision is not his own. Watch what he's doing here. He's sharing the vision of Jesus Christ from the point of view of the church, the spouse. You see that? So when I have encountered, when sharing your voice, and you begin to share somebody else's voice, so we're talking to a bishop. This is what I've experienced. The bishop, uh, and then I share an archbishop, his boss's voice. He'll say, well, it's better to ask the archbishop. This is the bishop responding. The bishop will say, well, why don't you talk to the archbishop, my boss, about his opinion? You know, that's a very veiled way to say, I don't want you talking about 
uh, the vision and the mindset of the church because if I get you talking about the archbishop's opinion versus my opinion, it's all relevant, right? And so he can have his opinion, I can have his opinion. You know, my opinion is uh, I like onions, his opinion is he doesn't like onions. I like fish, he likes pork. You know, this is not what we're talking about, folks. What you want to do is you want to talk about the truth. You want to be consuming truth. Is it true or is it false that it is always wrong for one person, morally wrong, for one person to uh, take advantage of another, okay. to oppress another? Is it always wrong for a bishop to oppress a priest? You know, that's a pretty straightforward the answer morally on the mindset of the church. It's always wrong. And that's in the teachings of the Pope, but they don't talk about that. So let's go on. By way of elementary truth, there's that word truth. Those who generally profess faith in Christ are people who listen to his teaching, learn from them, and abide by them. These people are designated the Christian faithful. As such, they are constituent members of the church, which is the mystical body of Christ, in line with the text and code uh, context of the New Testament. That is to say, they are the corporate members of the church, with Christ as the head. His vicar on earth is the Pope, who is also called the Holy Father or the Supreme Pontiff. You see how powerful that is? Let's look at that. Let's unbundle it. Elementary truth. Uh, those who genuinely profess faith. Now, the genuinely profess faith. There are many cannot genuinely, how do you not genuinely profess faith? Well, I can tell you, uh, one way to generally not profess faith is this. If I tell you that I'm a pilot, okay, I'm a pilot, and we're getting ready to go on a trip, and I've got my airplane ready, and I say, hey, to you, were you ready to board the airplane? And they'll say, yes. I say, I'm your pilot. Guess what? I don't know how much gas is in that airplane. I don't know how much fuel it is, but hey, you know, why don't you get on? We'll re disregard the truth of the matter, and we'll just hope that we get to our destination. By the way, we're going to go six hours. We're going to go from New York to L.A., but I don't know what the level of fuel is. Now, truth, I've jettisoned truth. I just got to feel that we can make it. I can really feel we can make it. Now, now what do you think about that when that happens? Are you going to get on that plane? I guarantee you no one will get on that plane. Okay? So when he says, who generally profess faith in Christ, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about a genuine faith. We're not talking about a feeling. And we're not talking about uh, the pilot in command just says, well, I've done it many times and I've never crashed. It's not what we're talking about. We want to ask that pilot, pilot, go look at the fuel gauges. Pilot, we want to know what those instruments say. Tell us what the gauges say. Tell us if the mechanic says the gauges are accurate because those gauges were created by not you and not the mechanic, but in a factory, and they were certified accurate. So you're telling, when you talk to your pope, or you talk to your priests, or your staff, you say, hey, I understand how you feel about this. What I want to know is what do the gauges say? The gauges are the teachings of the church. What do the instruments say on the level of fuel? That's and you're asking him to go and tell you what the mindset of the church is. What does his boss say? What does Pope say? And even Popes can't deviate from the truth. They can't say tomorrow there's four persons in the Trinity and Mary's the fourth person. They can't do that. They, you know, they are limited. And so you want to say, what is the truth of the matter from this formamentous mindset of the church? And you'll find that many things have been defined. And there's answers, and there are also things that are not defined and uh, have not been answered uh, it, definitively. But the church addresses many, many... I never, After I researched, I've never had a topic that the church hasn't discussed either at the level in Rome or through the saints. So, uh, the faithful profess faith in Christ are people who listen to his teachings. If you've got a deacon, priest, or bishop, or staff members that are not listening to his teachings, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. 
Are you going to get on that airplane with that person going from LA, uh, back, uh, New York to LA and you don't know the fuel? You're going to crash and burn? Is that what you want to do? So listen to his teachings, learn from them, and abide by them. That's quite a bundle there. We can talk about that for a long time. These people are designated the Christian faithful. As such, they are the constituent members of the church, which is the mystical body of Christ, in line with the text and context of the New Testament. And that's you, folks. Your voice is important. Your distress to be made known is important. Now, oftentimes there's fear, so we have many volunteers that will make your voice known and, and keep it confidential. And so that is 15 minutes. I didn't think I was going to go that long. I'm trying to keep these to two or three minutes. I've only got to page four, which is the first page. We'll come back in a follow-up, okay? Thank you. Pray for me.